I have known Brother Bob for a long time, and uh, we hillbillies by birth, and uh, darn proud of it, let me tell you right now. You know, I always said that, I said, we was, we was raised so far up in the holla, we had hoot owls for chickens and possums for house cats, and my, my sister had sent me a tote of pictures here a couple years ago, and just this past, I, within the last month or two, finally opened them up. They were from when Mama passed away, and so she'd sent me copies of all kinds, and, and so I'm going through these pictures, and all of a sudden, I come across the cat box on the front porch, and sitting on the cat box was a big old possum. <laughs> so it is true when I say that. So anyway, and I've got the picture to prove it. Hallelujah. Well, I do want to honor Brother Bob and Miss Christie as your pastors, and um, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, a couple years ago, I retired from full-time pastoral ministry um, to go into full-time pastoral ministry, and uh, um, it's uh, uh, what I thought was, you know, I used to, uh, at one time, the, the congregation was three or four hundred people, and beautiful facility and stuff like that, and then I decided my time was done and uh, through some trials and tribulations, and so I, I, I called it quits and just said, I felt like the Lord gave me the release, and then I began to work for the third largest hospice company in the United States, and now I minister to over several thousand families every month, uh, whether they're the bereaved families or they're the families in the practice of actually dying and uh, as the spiritual care liaison for them. And so I went from a few families to <laughs> a lot of families. So I don't, know, I don't know how that worked, but it worked. But um, I truly honor you guys for allowing me to be here today, especially here on Easter Sunday, and uh, uh, hope it be a blessing to you. If you got your Bible with you this morning, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 20. And if you don't have one, just grab a hymnal and look real... Wait a minute, you don't have hymnals either. Just pick your phone up and fake it, okay? We can do that nowadays. And just look, look real spiritual, okay? But um, we... Uh, I want to share with you from the resurrection of Christ. It's Easter Sunday, amen? amen. I, 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 you know, I know we use the term Easter. I usually don't. I use Resurrection Sunday and um, just a habit of mine. But it's truly... The, the, the words ring true. Because he lives, we too shall live. Amen. I look in the eyes of the death and the dying every day. Literally. Every day I'm looking into the eyes of those who are dying. And it's a variety of ages. I'm thankful we don't do pediatrics, but we do everything else. And I watched a 39-year-old die on, on, on Friday or Thursday night who had a 15-year-old and 11-year-old child. That's tough. And with a husband looking at you wanting to know what the answer was. And all you can say is you need to trust in Christ. Because when it boils down to it, our faith in Christ is all we really have. And our faith is not in a Savior who lays in a tomb. Buddha's in a tomb. Yeah. Muhammad is in a tomb. Right. You can go find their bodies. Moses is in a tomb. Where God knows, but I can show you the patriarch David, where he is, and where Abraham is. But in all the thousands of years trying to put down Christianity and trying to prove Christianity wrong, the one thing you can say is they've never found a tomb with the body of Jesus in it. That is right, brother. That tomb is empty. He's not there. And so we do celebrate life today. A life given to the undeserving. And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about. I've entitled this message, The Gardener. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word out of respect for God's Word. John chapter 20, and drop, drop down to verse 11. And we're going to share just a few verses here with you. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laying. And then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Everybody say gardener. gardener. Said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to the Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Mm. All these years, Lord, your word still chokes me up. Father, give us revelation today that we might know the gardener. Lord, use me as your vessel this morning. May I be your mouthpiece. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. As I shared Friday night, the greatest war in the history of mankind in times past, in times present, or in times future was warred out. When Christ hung on the cross and when Jesus gave his life up, when he, when he said, I commend into your hands my spirit, when he, when he trusted the Father and commended that spirit, in the greatest war, the greatest battle of mankind that had ever been fought was finished. But before we can ever know the victory of the resurrection, which is what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about how great the glorious resurrection is, we need to first understand what was lost. You'll never know what's won until you understand what's lost. And so to understand what's lost, we need to go back in history. We need to go back to the beginning of this book. We need to go all the way back to the front pages to the words that Moses would pin down, that God instructed him. In Genesis 1 and 26, we're going to understand the original intent and the original relationship intent between man and God. Because when you understand that, then you begin to understand what's been restored to us through the resurrection and through the empty tomb. See, one of the greatest emblems, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed down through the years, the greatest emblem of our faith is the cross, but honestly, it reminds me of my shame. It reminds me of my sin. Because had I not failed, there would never been a cross. But I'm waiting for the day that I walk into the church and there's a big empty tomb sitting there. Because you see, my, my hope doesn't lie just into the finished work of the cross, but my hope transcends life because there's an empty tomb. And so when we go back to the garden, we, we look at the heart of God. In Genesis 1 and 26 it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You are made, you were created in the image of God. Now, I know we're not quite there today. You see, Adam was originally made in the image of God. He was without sin. He was spotless. He could be both natural man and spirit man, just like the resurrected Christ. Because if you go and read and study it, you'll see later when Seth is born, it says Seth was in the image of his father, Adam. So he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. So God created 
man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God's original intent for man was that man would rule and reign on this earth. That we would be a generation of priests, a kingdom priest, and we would have dominion over the air, we would have dominion over the fish, we would have dominion that's over the land, we would have total dominion over this earth, and we would rule it and reign it in the image of God because we were made in His image. But then God planted a garden. A garden called Eden. Or let's put it this way. There was a garden planted in the world, and they called that area Eden. But in the midst of that garden, there was a tree. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man. Notice He put the man. He had formed, and out of the ground God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Let me give you a picture. Here's the world. Here's Eden. And in the midst of Eden is this spot where the tree of life grows. Does that sound familiar? Moses is instructed to build a tabernacle with an inner court. And inside the inner court, place a holy of holies. See, this is where Adam was placed. Come here, Brother Bob. Stand right here in front of the people. You're too, you're tall, so I got to have steps. Y'all remember the Ark of the Covenant? There's an angel here. There's an angel here. The two cherubims. But see, we only see it from that perspective because one was missing. There was an angel called Lucifer who stood in the place of the fiery stones and his job to be was the angel that covereth. Literally behind the Lord, covering him. But he fell. And now a replacement had been chosen. And they called him man. Because you are to worship the Almighty God. You're to cover Him with your prayers and your praise and your hallelujahs and your worship. You are now the one that was designed to replace Lucifer. And you took his position because you were to walk with God. If you're the angel that covereth, you don't go anywhere that God doesn't go because you're covering him. That is original intent. Did you ever notice how it was say that God would come down in the cool of day and what would He do? He would walk with man. You were designed and created to have dominion in this world. And when the Almighty would show up, you would cover Him with your prayers and your worship. And notice it wasn't just only out in the world, but it was in the most holy place in the midst of the garden where there was the tree of life. Original intent. God said to Adam, in this place, you're going to be my gardener. You're going to tend and keep it. If you look at those verbs when you go read them in the Hebrew... It means you're going to watch over it and protect it. And on that resurrection morning, there was a man standing outside a tomb whom Mary didn't recognize. And she presumed him to be the gardener. The one who watched, kept over, and protected the garden. See, what the first Adam couldn't do, the second Adam has done. There was a first Adam and there is a second Adam. 
The result, look, look at the result. Look at Genesis chapter 3. If you got your Bible with you, just turn there. We're going to get through this quickly. Look at the result of the fall of man. I want you to see something. And I hope you see something you've never seen because you're going to identify this with Christ. It says, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Who'd ever think you'd be in Genesis on Resurrection Sunday morning, huh? But why wouldn't the first be the last if the last is going to be first? Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, and the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the servant, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree that's which in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. And we can preach a whole sermon on the three temptations of the devil. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. They were disobedient. Transgression had taken place. Sin had entered into the world. The result of this sin tells us in Genesis 3, 17 and 19. It says, and, and Adam, he said, Because you heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In it you shall, eat, in, in it you shall toil and you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field." In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. I don't know what God intended for man to eat, but it sure wasn't salad. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm telling you, a vegetarian you weren't designed to be. I got scripture to back me up. Every vegetarian is now mad at me. I don't know that we were designed to eat meat. I think we were designed to feed off the Word of God. And it's sweet to the lips, but at times it's bitter to the belly. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and also eat of the tree. You think about that. If I looked at you and said, here's a fruit, you eat it, you'll live forever. Or here's a fruit, you'll know the difference between good and evil. Which one are you going to eat? Dude, I'm over here on the eat all of life, you know? Man. I ain't figured that one out, but I'm going to have to ask Adam when I get there. Dude, really? Lord. He said, therefore the Lord God said to him, sent him. The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden. Notice, where did God come and dwell? In the midst of the garden. That's where he'd walk in the cool day. Here is where God is separating Adam from his presence. He sent him out of the garden. And so he drove out the man, and he placed a cherubim in the east of the garden of Eden with a flaming sword, which turned in way, turned every way to guard the way of life. You know, when we read that, I used to always think he set him there to protect man from sneaking back in and eating of that tree. But honestly, I think he set that angel there with a the flaming sword as a beacon to say, there is a way home. There's going to be a way home. But here's the problem. Have you ever re you've read the story? We know, that, we know that the sin was not in the woman. The sin was in the man and is passed down and transferred because sin came from Adam, right? Adam tried to blame the woman. He said, but Lord, that woman you gave me. 
There lies the issue. Not me. What? Typical. Huh. You know that had to be my wife. But then I read a scripture one day that messed me up on my whole Genesis story. What mess you up? Mess your Genesis story up. Comes from 2 Timothy 2.14. Watch this. And Adam Adam was not deceived. Whoa. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But Adam was not deceived. So what does that mean? When his wife Eve offered him the fruit, he knew exactly what he was eating. And he knew exactly that he wasn't supposed to be eating it because he was not deceived. She was. Whoa. And I said, Lord. See, me and the Lord get into weird conversations. Y'all don't ever want to be able to have to go in here. It's not a happy place at times. Because I'm the little kid that always says, Why? But why? Well, it's going to rain tomorrow. Why? Well, there's clouds moving in. That's how it works. But why? You know, I got the feeling God's got irritated a few times at me. And he has. Yeah, and at 53, look what he gives me, 11-month-old. So I said, Lord... What in the world, Adam, I want to slap you in the face because you weren't even deceived and you ate of it. You ain't got a good excuse. You could at least said, hey, you know, that woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit. But Adam, you big dork, you knew what you was eating. (laughs) Honestly. And then it hit me. There's a first Adam and a second Adam. The first Adam and the last Adam. Now watch this. When Eve came back from eating that fruit, see, I don't believe like everybody else does, some of these people that believe that he was with her at the time. I don't believe it. Because I don't believe Satan would have approached her had he been with her because he was the covering one. When she came back, she was totally changed. Because what's that scripture say? She wasn't deceived and she fell into what? Transgression. She had lost her luster. Now, what I mean by that is, I, I, I'm just I'm thinking of this, these terms. There was a radiance about them, because they were like God. They were also in the flesh, but also in the spirit. They were they were perfect beings. But when she came back after eating the fruit, guess what? She was no longer perfect. But Adam had been with God, and there was a lamb slain since the foundation of the world who also was being called Adam, a man. And I honestly believe Adam looked at her and he thought, for me to save her, I got to identify with her. And so he thought he had to become like her to save her because he had seen something very similar to that in glory because there was a lamb slain since the foundation who took on the identity of mankind and took upon the body of flesh that he might save them. But the thing he forgot was that the second Adam was going to do it without sin. And so the first Adam tried to identify with her to save her and all he did was become like her and curse a generation for all of eternity. Isn't it interesting that the word curse is spelled C-U-R-S-E, but if you take the S out of it, it's spelled C-U-R-E. You take the sin out of it and you got the cure. You take the sin out of the curse and you'll find the cure. And so Adam couldn't identify, he identified with her, but he couldn't redeem her because he did it with sin. 
But there was another Adam who was coming that he had seen of and thought of and thought maybe it was him, but it wasn't because it's the Son of God who took on the embodiment of flesh and he lived and he died and he gave his life for us, but he did it spotlessly. No sin, no tarnishment that he might redeem us. The first Adam was trying to redeem his bride. The second Adam, coming out of a garden also, did redeem his bride. Woo! Glory. That'll preach a while. Sin entered by one man. And great judgment came. A curse that we still suffer from today. But with great judgment comes great grace. With great judgment came a great battle. As I shared Friday, and I know a lot of you weren't here, and I'm going to share this again. As Jesus hung on that cross, there were two conversations going on, one in the natural world and one in the spirit world. You say, well, can you prove that? Yes, I can. If you go read the gospel writers, you'll see the words, the last seven sayings of Christ on the cross. You'll see what he was uttering in the natural world. But if you go to Psalm 22 and you begin to read the words of prophet David as he would write the words down of Christ while he was on the cross, you'll see there was a spiritual battle taking place and he was warring against principalities and powers as he hung between heaven and earth. And in that greatest battle, he would utter words like, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He would talk about the many strong bulls of Bashan and the roaring lions as they gaped their mouth upon him. But then, as he hung on the cross, he uttered the words, It is finished. And he drank and he said, Father, into your hands do I commend my spirit. In the beginning he was crying, My God, my God, where art thou? Why have you forsaken me? But that's because the crushing blow of the sin of mankind, the curse that was rendered in the Garden of Eden, was now come into the, his place upon Calvary. And all the sins of past, present, and future was now coming upon Christ himself. And in that, in that moment, in that part of time, literally the crushing weight of it all landed upon him. My sin. Your sin. Everybody's sin. And he bore that sin. He bore all of it. He bore your failings of tomorrow. He bore that bad thought you're going to have here in a few months. He bore it all as he hung between heaven and earth. And he would cry out, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. My strength is dried up. Dogs have surrounded me. They parted my garments. They pierced my hands and feet. And he would cry out, he would say, Save me, Lord, from the lion's mouth. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. And then David says, he said this, you have answered me. Oh. The father looked down and said, it's enough. You've done enough. You bore it all. And when he heard the voice of the father, he said, Father, into your hands do I commend my spirit. In the next three days, see, they wrapped him up. They took him down. And they laid him in the tomb. But he spent the next three days in hell. Yeah. 
leading captivity captive. Go read the book of Ephesians. Before he that ascended on high first descended down into the depths. Listen, when he looked at the thief and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise, he wasn't talking about heaven. He was talking about Abraham's bosom. Hell is the only place mentioned in Scripture that says it hath enlarged itself. To enlarge it, you have to take over something. So literally all the Old Testament saints were being held in a place called Abraham's bosom, and they were there waiting on a Savior to come. And he descended down in the depths, preached the captivity to them, and led them out. And the moment they left Abraham's bosom, hell expanded and enlarged itself, consumed every bit of it, and now that you've only got heaven or hell is your choice when you die. And that's a choice you've got to make before you die. That's the truth of the Bible. He ascended. Here again, I ask them weird questions. He's up out of the grave. It's Easter Sunday morning. Rose before the sun rising. Who's the first one there? The one who he forgave the most. One who's considered a prostitute. Possessed with many demons. The one who loved him. She wasn't afraid of no soldiers. She wasn't afraid of anything. Her love outweighed her fear. Can I preach for a moment? Listen, your love, when you're on death's day door, when you're lying there and getting ready to cross over, the only thing that you're going to need, and listen, I can say this with expertise, is to know the love of God because that's what's going to separate you from the fear of death. I've watched people leave this world loving God. And I've got the testimony of those who left this world screaming that they were descending down into the depths of hell and literally blisters appear on their feet before they die. That's truth. Don't tell me they ain't no God. What the new statistic? More atheists in the world than there are Christians? There's more fools in the world. Because I'm telling you, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And whether you receive the love of God or not is the determining factor whether you make heaven and not hell. Here Mary goes running out. She wanted to check on Jesus. I got to wonder if as she was going out there and they had the burial spices, I got to wonder if something in her was saying, I remember when he used to say, but after three days. I hope it's true. But you see, I'm a doubter. Because when she got there, she wanted to know where they took his body. But she met a gardener. who revealed himself to her in one word, Mary. It's what he did for me, Brother Bob, one day. I was in a tractor and trailer hauling limestone from Valley Brook Brook, uh, Materials. On the way to the, DN, the West Virginia DHR office, or not DHR, the West Virginia Department of Highways, when they had the office right there off the road in Ripley. Right there. And I was on my way. I heard the word Craig. And then he asked me, brother, where was I going to go? And I thought, Lord, I'm just going up here, drop this load of stone off. If that be you, Lord, that's all I'm doing. Then he asked again, where are you going? I said, Lord, I'm going to go to hell. He said, my son, you don't have to. I took care of this for you. I finished it 2,000 years ago, but from the very beginning, it was my plan the whole time. I understood what Adam was going to do. And I know his heart was intended to do right, but he messed it up. But my son is coming. He didn't mess it up. He was tempted in all points just like we are. 
There's nothing we face that he didn't face, but he did it without sin. And Mary went to embrace him. And he said, Mary, don't touch me. Did you ever ask the question why he said, don't touch me? If you go to the Levitical priesthood, even though he was owner of the Melchizedek, there was still something that was right about things. In the Levitical priesthood, if you was bringing an offering to the Lord, it was declared clean. And if it would touch anything unclean, the clean offering didn't make the unclean clean. The unclean made the clean offering unclean. Mary was still unclean. She was still in her sin. And he had a blood offering that he needed to send to the Father. So you remember he said, I've not yet ascended to my Father. I've been in hell. He hadn't applied the blood to the mercy seat yet. And so he couldn't let Mary touch him because she would have made him unclean just by her very presence and touch. But he knew he had a job to do, and that was to take his very own precious blood and place it upon the mercy seat in heaven and make an atonement for all of mankind. And you'll notice when he showed up after that, what was everybody able to do? He looked at Thomas and said, Here, Thomas, go ahead and touch him. It don't matter because it's finished. The blood has been applied. And when we still today, when we apply the blood, the unclean becomes clean. All your failures are washed away. You're no longer rejected. You're no longer separated. But now you are one with God and you are walking in the attended purpose that He had for you. You want to know why we... Listen, if we would take that piano. Brother, if you'd take that piano and write a song based on my DNA. If for every one of those little markers in my DNA, if you would put a key to it and write it, and then get Brother Bob and take his DNA, and every one of your markers write a song to it, do you realize you could go through the whole world of all people of all times and never write the same song? Because everybody has unique DNA in and of to themselves. So listen, there's a song that only you can utter. There's a song, there's a praise that lies in you that is impossible to replicate because it can only be given by you. Wow. God intended you to cover Him in praises and in worship. Are you doing that today? I don't know what time you usually get out. But I think I've said enough. And we're going to beat the Baptist. Oh, wait a minute. We are the Baptist. <laughs> kind of. Pentecostal side of me wants to go another 40 minutes. <laughs> Let me ask you today. Are you living your original attempt? Come here, Madison. Take this from me. Thank you. And she can sing. I'm I'm serious. I mean sing. You would be shocked. I get shocked every time she sings. Of course, she got it from me. Yeah, we know that ain't true. I couldn't carry a tune in five-gallon bucket. (laughs) Are you living in the intent? There's an old term. I don't know, maybe you all have used it. It was always used when I was a kid growing up and, 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 you know, from hillbilly side. You all might be in the backwater, but it's a little further over that way. (laughs) Called milly-mouthing. Don't milly mouth. That's how a lot of Christians live. Well, I love the Lord. A pastor. Devil's been on me all week. I just don't know that I'm going to make it. Can you pray for me? Hey, are you walking in the victory of Jesus? Pray for yourself. He intended for you to have dominion and authority. He intended for you to rise up when the devil jumps on you and say, Get off me, devil! I ain't got time for that. 
Hey, old demon, get off my child. You get out of my house and don't you ever come back. I command you to go into the dry places. Prepare for you and the rest of them. And if you don't like it, I'll send you into a herd of swine. God intended for us to walk in victory and to have authority and power and have dominion over the world that we live in. Listen, we need a bunch of us to get together and look the world, look right across this mountain and say, you know what, we've had enough of abortion. It ain't going to go no more. You stop killing those babies. Well, no, I'll sit over here and be quiet. That wouldn't be very Christian, unchristian to me like to stand up and do that. Lord, how would you like to been in the temple that day when Jesus turned the tables over and took a cord? and chased everybody out. Lord, come back and go through Washington, D.C., please. I want to see that on CNN and be explained away. Well, Jesus wasn't being very Christian that day. He was threatening people with a whip. Stop listening to the world to tell you how to live. Pick up the book. There you go. You had, you know, old Saul, God looked at Saul and said, Saul, go in there and kill them all. Okay, Lord. Oh, yeah, I ain't going to kill him. We need him. Samuel showed him a thing or two. Samuel came in, called him out on it, and showed him how to cut that dude's head off real quick. But he was the prophet of God. That wasn't very prophet of the of you, Samuel. Samuel, why do you got to be like that? So, like, you all militant and stuff and everything, and you angry all the time. You're supposed to have the love of God in you. Ain't that what the world says? Yeah. The moment you stand against unrighteousness, the world will say, well, that ain't very nice of you. If you've seen the price of sin upon my Savior on the cross, you would understand why I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say, no, that ain't right. And no, we're not going to have a part of that. Because that's what my Savior bled and died for. That's why He was beaten beyond a pulp. That's why He did what He did. And now we're just going to look at it and say, well, I found out. That little baby right there, you're going to see Samuel all in me if you hurt that baby. Amen. Come on. I know how to gut a deer. I've gut a bunch of them. There you go. Amen. And I'm still hillbilly. I tell people all through the South, people down the South, see, they just rednecks. Yeah. I proudly declare I'm hillbilly. <laughs> We're a whole nother class. I'm telling you, ain't that awful preacher be like that? Man loves people when they're dying and cares for them, cries with them, gets tore up and cries over Scripture. But Lord, if you touch his kid, he would kill you in a heartbeat. <laughs> and honestly, any man that won't do that for his kid, I wouldn't think much of him being much of a Christian. Stand up for the truth because Christ died for it. Amen. Stand against sin because Jesus bore that. Think about it this way. If Adam had been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have still died. And he would have bore one sin. But instead he bore all sins. Even the ones we still create today, he's bearing them. Come on, amen. That's right. So why don't we put an end to the suffering he had to endure by just simply stopping sinning and walking after him and being what we were designed to be, to have dominion and to cover him with worship and with prayers. Amen. And to just love him back. The greatest display of love in the world was on that cross. The power of grace was in the empty tomb. And because 
he lives, we too shall live. I believe this Resurrection Sunday morning, we owe a debt. Oh, now listen, brother. Salvation is by grace alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's my King James impression. That's funny, all I read all news King James, but all I think I can quote is in King James. What happened along that journey somewhere? <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> I think it was how I was raised. But we owe a debt. <clears throat> when the doctor fixes you, what's the next thing that comes? Bingo. <laughs> Bingo, Brother Bob. I'm sorry. I just apologize now for the bill you got. <laughs> you get a bill. How many of you don't pay that bill? Oh, my. Anybody? Why? Because you received a service and it's a debt you owe. Well, what we receive from the Lord, we can't repay. But we sure can walk in the original intent that God had for us that He restored us back to. Which means to give Him praise and prayers and worship and to guard and keep the garden. That means to stand for truth. When you see evil coming, you meet it head on. Did you notice something? I want you to see something. We're getting Pentecostal now. Waxing later in the day. Eve had absolutely no fear of Satan or of the dragon when he showed up. Did you notice that? Brother, don't be between me and the door if a snake shows up. (laughs) I say this to all the nurses I work with. If you ever see me running, you need to run. Because something bad's about to happen. Seriously. They used to, when, when, we got, when we started operating in the gifts, and I know Brother Bob knows this too, first thing you're accused of is snake handling. Well, I looked at people and say, that just shows how dumb you are and how much you know me. Because there ain't going to be no snakes in my neighborhood. So here Eve is in the garden, a serpent shows up, starts talking to her. And she's like, well, yes. I'm like, "Ah!" because that just ain't right. It's not. Notice how I drug out right? I've learned that in the South. You drag words out. Hello. Sweet tea. One, let, one syllable, friend, one syllable, not 40. She apparently had encountered him before. Because once you have an encounter with something, your fear of it becomes less. But I got the feeling when she encountered him before, she didn't encounter him alone. Now, this is pure speculation. This is not Bible. I always put that disclaimer out there. This is mine. I believe the other times they saw him was when he was trying to sneak into the garden and Adam saw him. And Adam had a purpose to keep and tend to the thing. And he looked at Satan and he says, you do not belong in here because this is the place where God walks and you lost that position and now it's mine. Do you ever wonder why Satan decided he hated us so much? And Adam had dominion and authority at that moment in that time. He could look at the devil and say, get out, and he would have to get out. But he lost that dominion. And now the thing that scares Satan more than anything and everything is that the church learns that same dominion one more time. Because in my house, I understand that dominion. I understand it's been restored to me. So when the devil tries to come, I tell him, I'm sorry, it's time for you to pack your bags and get out. And if you don't get out, I'm going to grab you by your britches and the nap of your neck, and I'm going to throw you out. Because God has given me that power and that authority and that dominion by the finished work 
of the cross. Colossians says that he put to an open shame all the principalities and powers. We keep wrestling and fighting defeated enemies. We keep allowing defeated enemies to wear us out and wear us down. Why? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world by the finished work of the cross. You owe a debt. You can't pay it. But you sure can walk in the authority, the dominion, and the power that God has given you. And you can allow that in the midst. See, the thing is, you ain't healed yet, are you, Christy? And in the beginning, you might not have been able to praise Him. But guess what? I saw you praising Him today. And even though you ain't 100%, you're still giving it up. See, you don't have to be perfect to be able to praise Him. You don't have to have it all together to be able to praise Him. Because He's already finished it. You don't have to have everything feeling right to praise Him. Listen, you just show up and keep... Sometimes just staying in the fight. Ain't it, baby? Just staying in the fight (laughs) is enough. Not not, Not willing to back down. Get real spiritual on you. Bon Jovi did a song called Crush in, in his album uh, Crush. What was the name of the title of it? No, nah, that ain't it. I don't either. I can't remember. But anyway, it's got a verse in the sign that says this. Don't bend, don't break, don't back down. I won't bend, I won't break, and I won't back down. Have you ever got up when you're feeling bad and said, Devil, I got news for you. Old body... See, this old body's going to give up one day. It's committed to all men to die once. But I'm thankful I ain't got the second death, amen? amen. This old body gets worn out. I got bad shoulder, bad ankle. I got all kinds of stuff. I've suffered wounds from playing football and car wrecks and just being abusive to my body and everything else. But I've just decided I ain't going to quit. I told the Lord when that little one was coming that, Lord, I just need to stay long enough to walk her down the aisle into the hands of a good man. One like the second Adam, not the first. Because if he's like the first, I'll be old enough. It won't matter. I'll just have to kill him. (laughs) Just saying, Lord, I did this for the right reason. You know, you told him to kill the whole city. I was just getting the infidel out of the camp. Right. Come here. Come on, Dad. Ah. Yes. This is how God looks at us. This is how God looks at I don't care how old you are. This is how he sees you. His baby. And he only wants the very best. And I got to tell you something. The one that's been attacking you, he's going to bury his hind end in a lake of fire one day forevermore. Give that dad a kiss. Don't give that dad a kiss. Say, no, I see too many people. Give me a kiss. Not going to do it. So, dad, dad, why'd you bring me up here in front of all these people? You know the only thing I want from her? only thing is to hear her say, I love you. That's it. I love it when she runs to Dada. Well, crawls right now. And a lot of times she'll give Dada sugars, won't you? Hmm? You're too nervous right now, ain't you? Give Dada sugar? Hmm? Not yet. Sugar? Give me sugar. Come on. Show these people you can give me sugar. Sugar. Just about, but y'all's laughing. Way to go. (laughs) Well, this morning, you just tell God you love him. And my friend, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're suffering from a curse that's over 6,000 years old. But today, God could remove the S from your curse and bring you the cure. First Adam got kicked out of a garden. Second Adam walked out of a tomb 
in the midst of a garden and said, I am he that's alive and alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. I just want you to love on God today. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want you to get up and walk down here to Brother Bob and put your hand in his hand and say, Lord, I need Jesus. Understand, that's, that's the only thing you need to know theologically. I need Jesus. I need saved from sin. But for the rest of you, if he saved you and you know it, won't you come today to this altar and worship him for a few minutes and just say, Father, I love you. Thank you for the eternal hope you've given me today in the empty tomb. Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, we love you. Move as you see fit in Christ's name.